This show can be found on Podcast DC, the new local app with hundreds of options in local news, health, and of course, the DMV region. Download the Podcast DC app to hear the Empire shows as well as other great content. Empire. It's story time on the Football Jones Podcast as we learn how to turn trials into triumph. What's up, everybody? It's Mike Jones. Thanks for coming back for another episode. You can read me at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ByMikeJones. And today, I've got a special treat for you because we're going to take a look at the life of former college standout and NFL hopeful Freddie Stevenson. If you're not familiar with the name... He was a running back or fullback for Florida State, helped them win a national championship several years ago, and had his shot at the NFL. But things don't play out the way you would expect from there. Yet, despite all that, he has found a way to really impact lives. And so we're going to talk to Freddie Stevenson today on today's episode and you're going to learn about his life i think there are lessons that we can all take from it and get a sneak peek into a book that he wrote that came out recently but before that just a quick little overview of where things stand in the league right now this is the final week of off-season practices so some teams last week had their mandatory mini camps last week Some of them are getting them done this week, and the practices that are left are voluntary for for some that aren't having their mandatory minicamp this week. Um, Just a lot of different action in a lot of different ways, but this is the week. And then next week, things go dark uh, until the start of training camp. But, you know, it's interesting. We're seeing that uh, I think one of the biggest names out there outside of Aaron Rodgers, Stephon Gilmore, of the New England Patriots is holding out uh, because he's entering the final year of his deal, making just a little more than $9 million, wants a new deal. He is one of the best cornerbacks on the market. Some will tell you he is the best, and he still wants a new contract, and so far hasn't gotten done, so he's not in camp. There's a number of other uh, players, uh, you know, decent stature, um, that are also holding out, and so we'll see. What happens between now and start of training camp? Uh, a little more than a month, so there's time for teams uh, to, you know, their front offices to get out the calculators and crunch the numbers and decide what they're going to uh, do about these, you know, whether they, they give out new contracts or what have you. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see. This is also the final we- work of action for rookies like uh, Trevor Lawrence and Josh Wilson. Uh, trying to soak up as much as they can before they have a layoff. Things go quiet at their facilities, and then they got to prepare, get ready for training camp. It'll be interesting to see their level of readiness, how quickly um, they have absorbed and also retained uh, the information that's getting thrown at them. Uh, but, you know, it's a process. It's not going to be perfect overnight, uh, no matter who you're talking to. But we will be following all of that as training camp kicks off the last week of July. But first, like I said, got a special guest, Freddie Stevenson. And let's roll with that right now. This episode is brought to you by HP+. In a world full of smart devices, shouldn't your printer be smart too? It is with HP+. These printers know when they're running low, so you always get the ink you need delivered right when you need it. Plus, you save up to 50% on ink, so you can print whatever you want, as much as you want, any time you want. Huh, that is pretty smart. Get six free months of instant ink when you choose HP+. Conditions apply. Visit hp.com smart for details. Have you joined in the fun and taken advantage of Empire Media's partnership with Monkey Knife Fight, the fastest growing daily fantasy sports site on the planet? Well, what are you waiting for? Get over to monkeyknifefight.com, give yourself a chance to win cash while playing a variety of contests in all kinds of different sports. 
Just so you know, the payouts for the Home Run Derby contest have been boosted. Last week, one player took home the entire MKF $5,000 prize pool. Get over to MKF.com, use the show code JONES, and receive a 100% deposit match up to $100. That's PlayMKF.com slash Jones. All right, and now here we are, happy to be joined on the Football Jones podcast by Freddie Stevenson. Freddie, um, thank you so much for joining me. You have a fantastic story that um, I think can help a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. And so I wanted to have you on here so you could tell us your story. But first off, how's everything? How are you doing today? Man, everything's great this morning. I got a great workout in, and now I'm just chilling with you guys, and I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity to come on your platform and tell my story. No, I, I appreciate you coming. Um, you know, for, for people who don't know, um, you are a former Florida State running back. Um, you had a, a short stint there in the NFL with the Chicago Bears um, after, um, uh, you know, after college, but football is only a very small part of your story. Um, you know, and, and you wrote this book here, and I just want to kind of give people a snapshot of your story and um, what has brought you to this point here because you've started a clothing line and, and you're trying to do a lot of different things with young people. Uh, but, but can you kind of tell us, um, Freddie Stevenson, who is he, where he came from, and what makes you different than just any old former football player? Without a doubt. Yeah, Freddie Stevenson is an individual who's overcome tough trials, tribulation, just like, like the rest of us. And I've used those struggles and, and my journey to strengthen me along the path and just gain wisdom along my journey. And now I'm trying to use my knowledge and the things that I've learned along the process to give back to the, the upcoming generation. And there was a point in my life where if you would have asked me that question, I wouldn't know, know how to answer it. If you'd say who's Freddie Stevenson, I would have told you Florida State fullback or NFL fullback. That was all I knew. And that's all I trained myself to be my whole entire life. And transitioning after the game, it, it was tough for me because I feel like a lot of players, they struggle with this. Your whole identity is wrapped up into being a football player and you haven't got in the touch. Come to grips with the person you truly are outside of the game. And, Making that transition for me was difficult, very difficult. And being someone who's overcome a lot to get up to this point, being homeless and coming up in poverty, I think the transition after the game was the toughest for me. And ultimately figuring out who I truly was, my true passions outside of the game, it was a tough process. But in, during the darkest moments of my life, I was able to find purpose and it was a blessing. Now you've written this book, Trials to Triumph, um, that came out 2019. Um, can you kind of take us through your trials? Like you said, you, you came up in poverty. Sometimes when kids grow up, they don't realize what they don't have. Did, were you aware um, that, that poverty was something that really impacted your family? And, and kind of take us through some of those trials, um, what your family life was like as you were growing up. Yeah, early on, we had to deal with a lot with my father being incarcerated for drug trafficking. And my mother, she was faced with raising five kids on her own. And like you said, we don't we didn't really know what we were dealing with. You, you see some things, but as a kid, you just want to have fun. You don't really pay attention to a lot. And there was one situation that occurred one day and it kind of hit us all like, yo, this is bad. Like, we, we got to get out of the situation. And my mother... She was just walking us around that day and my baby sister, she just started crying because she was hungry all day. Like we, had, we hadn't eaten at all. And usually my mom, she'd get us like a, a piece of bread or something individually. We all get our own piece of bread, something. We would eat something. But it was like eight o'clock in the evening and we hadn't eaten. So my little sister starts crying, fussing, and then everybody else is, we're wondering if we want to get to eat that night. And my mother, she just gathers everybody together, calms us down, and she just starts walking us. And we didn't know where she was going. As we're walking, we come up on a McDonald's. Go inside, my mother, she orders a cheeseburger. And immediately we just look around each other like, okay, that's, that's five of us. And include my mom is six. So like, man, what are we gonna do with one cheeseburger? 
And at the time, we didn't know my mom only had a dollar to her name. So the total comes out to a dollar and five cents. And my mother, I remember her asking the lady at the cash register, register the cashier if she could get the burger without having that nickel because she didn't have a nickel. And for some reason, the lady was being difficult that day. She wouldn't allow it. So we had to watch my mom go around McDonald's begging for a nickel. And someone was eventually generous enough to give her that nickel. And at this time, we're like, we're embarrassed. So she takes us all outside and starts slicing the burger up into five pieces and starts handing it out to each and every one of us individually. And as we're eating, my older sister, she notices that my mom isn't eating. And she just stops and offers her some food and asks her why she wasn't eating. And my mom, she just said, no, you eat it, you eat it, baby. And she just burst into tears. And at that moment, it was like, man, like we got, we got to do something to get out of our situation. And I remember making a promise to my mom early on because I used to always run around with the football and they were trying to get me into sports. But I made a promise to her that I was going to go to the NFL and change our family situation. And that's ultimately that situation there along my journey has always motivated me. So, so how old were you at that time? I believe I maybe like three. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And, and so there had been something in your life that you knew that that football could be a way. What was it that kind of um, gave you that that insight that football could be a way out for you and your family? Just a kid that was a dreamer, honestly playing around with guys in the neighborhood and things like that. And I'm the I'm the younger guy, the little kid. But then you got the guys that are like five and six years old. They want they want me on the team. So early on, I knew that I had a gift. And I just ultimately, I always believed I was one of those people that despite my situation, I always believed that I would accomplish something great. So I, I believed that I would make it to the NFL and nothing was going to stop me. And I was, I believed that early on in my life. So of the five kids, where are you in that order? I'm like the middle. I got two old, an older brother, an older sister. So I'm the third. Okay. Gotcha. And I got two younger siblings. And then how long was your dad locked up? And when did, did, was there ever a point during your childhood when things started to stabilize for your family? Yeah, he was, he was incarcerated for three years. Okay. And it was, I talk about how everything transpired in my book, but he was able to get out of prison. Things worked out in his favor. And then we just went through that process where a lot of people were investing in us and trying to get us out of the inner city. And we we're ultimately able to get in a better situation, still struggling, but a lot of people were helping us out because they knew with my father back in the picture, how important it was to have that father figure in the household. And it, it was tough. I remember for a long period, he couldn't get a job because he's a felon. And it, it was tough for us trying to make ends meet, especially moving into a better area and even though we're in a better area, we're still financially the same people. So we have people invest us, invest in us and put us in a better area, but we're still those kids that were just a few months ago, we, we were struggling to make ends meet and we didn't have food at the table. So it, it was tough. And my father, one thing I respect about him is despite all of our struggles, he didn't turn back and go back to his old lifestyle. He, he grinded it out. And that ultimately showed me that as a man, you can't, you can't give up. Life's going to get hard. And I saw that early on and just having my father back in the picture, who was big, big for me. And I ultimately believe that was a big part in my growth process coming up. Cause all the time, whenever I go through some obstacles and you're human, sometimes you want you, you naturally like, man, I can't do this, man. People are trying to stop me, especially a kid. You have to build that with time. And my dad be like, no, you're not giving up. If you started something, if you committed to it, you're going to finish it. And that's ultimately what I saw him do with his life. He wasn't just talking about it. We watched him live it. And that was, that was great for us to see. Now you, you wind up becoming a, a very talented football player, playing in high school. You go to college, Florida State. Um, tell me what your, high, your, what your high school and college career in a snapshot, what was that like? What was it as you were starting to experience that success, both individual and team success? Um, after the struggles you had as a kid, what was it like having that success? 
Yeah, um, it's it's funny because a lot of people, when they look back, I ended up my senior year being one of the top 250 players in the country. But going into my junior year, I was unranked. Nobody was recruiting me. And I was one of the best guys in the county, best guys in the state. So I'm going through a phase where I don't know if I'm going to have an opportunity to play at the Division One level. Nobody's giving me any looks. Colleges are coming in, but they're not talking to me. And at the end of my junior season, like two, the second to last game of the season, I had an injury that doctor said was career ending. I broke my fibula, broke my ankle, lost all the cartilage in my ankle, broke a few bones in my foot. And I remember going up to the hospital, they showed me the x-rays and they told me that I wouldn't be able to play anymore. And I just remember doctors having to come calm me down because I told them like, man, listen, I understand it looks bad, but I made a promise to my mother. And this has been my dream since I was a kid and I'm, I'm gonna find a way to accomplish this this goal. I don't care what it takes. And I'm, I'm screaming, like I'm loud with it. And they, they come in and calm me down. And I just remember being bed bound for like four to five months. I had two surgeries to fix to fix the injury and I was bed bound four to five months. And it was looking bad, it was looking bad. Nobody was calling, nobody was calling. And I was just fortunate my highlight tape from my junior season got out there and one school took a chance on me. I remember it. Coach Allen Super from UMass. He reached out to me. said, man, we know about your injury. We're invested in you. If it takes you a year to, to rehab this thing, we're going we're gonna to invest in you. We want you here. And I remember just crying out tears because that journey, I didn't know if I was going to have an opportunity to play at that level. And I was like, man, I don't care if another school calls. I know I have an opportunity. But I was fortunate enough that schools kept calling every day. It's like I'm getting another offer. And fast forward a year later, we're holding up a national championship trophy after we knock, knock off Auburn in the BCS, the final BCS national championship game. Yeah, you you, you know, that was that was huge. I think you have seven rushing touchdowns um, as a fullback um, there at, at Florida State. Um, but everybody thinks, OK, boom, you're one step away. You didn't get drafted. How did you deal with that disappointment there as, you know, the draft, you're sitting, you're waiting, you're waiting, that call didn't come, um, you know, initially. And then, you know, how to, and then obviously you got an opportunity as an undrafted free agent, but, but what was that like sitting through the draft and then seeing it come and go without your name getting called? Yeah, my agent, he told me throughout the draft process that it was possible. I came out of college as the number one fullback. And he told me, man, you can get drafted in the fourth round or you can get undrafted. You never know with fullbacks. It just depends on team's needs. And I just remember going through the process, teams reaching out to me. Had a few teams reach out to me on day one of the draft. They're like, man, we're going to draft you. We got a draftable grade on you. And one team told me, like, man, we'll take you in the fourth. And it's transpired throughout the draft. You, it's, it's so unpredictable. So I'm expecting to at least get taken by the sixth round and just things just started happening. And that's, a lot of people have these stories. They thought they would win a little earlier. You see it every single year. But ultimately, yeah, your competitive side, you want to go early. But really, the goal, the goal is the goal. You want to play in the National Football League and, and make an impact. So, yeah, you're upset. You feel like a lot of teams uh, disrespected you. But at the same time, you have a job to do. So once I got that call, like, all right, let's go handle business. That's the past. Now let's move forward. So then how did things play out with Chicago? Yeah, I get to Chicago. I'm their, I'm their guy. And it's funny, I get there and they had a fullback on the roster and they were telling me a lot of things to sign with them. You just think, all right, man, they're talking a lot of teams are trying to sell you, sell you right now. They're like, man, you're our guy. Like, when you come in, we see you being our fullback of the future. As soon as I come in, the guy that I believe that was there for two years, they cut him as soon as I signed. So I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Like, they were serious. So I get in there, and I'm I'm not scared of competition. If anybody looks back at Florida State, every single year, anybody that knows, somebody's coming in trying to take a spot. I remember every single year they were trying to have me groom somebody, ultimately, that was brought there to take my job. And mentally, I'm like, man, nobody's going to – have the willpower to take take my job because ultimately they're not going to put in that work I'm going to put in and they're not willing to take it to the place I'm willing to take it to. And so when I get to that, le that level and I see no competition, 
it's like, all right, man, let's just continue to focus on getting better and taking care of business because your ultimate goal is to be the best fullback you can be for this team and ultimately one of the best in the league. And a few things transpired. I think a guy is – and guy works in mysterious ways. A guy gets cut from the Lions, and he has some – he has an earlier, a prior relationship with the coaching staff. So they bring him in. And I remember the first day he comes in, they're like, yeah, this guy's going to make our team, our team better immediately. I'm like, oh, my, what? Like, all right. <laughs> in, in, my, in my mind, I'm a confident guy. Like, man, this is not a fullback in the league that'll beat me out physically. Like, no. So I was like, man, in my head, I'm like, as long as they give me opportunity, I'll take advantage of that. So I get in camp. I'm doing a lot of different things, playing running back, H back, and – it was just one of those situations where you knew this was the guy that they were favoring, and I'm not going to sit here and complain. I just knew that I couldn't make a mistake. So we get to, I think it's the second to last preseason game. I break for a run and um, reach out for a first down, and the guy pokes it out. He, pu- he punches the ball out, and everybody on the team like, he's down. And then I knew I, knew I was down, but when you look back at the replay, Bodies are in the way, and they called the fumble on the field. So I'm like, man, I've been killing it in camp. All the coaches are surprised. But this is that one opportunity they were looking for. I gave them a reason. And when you're in those situations where all the odds are against you, you can't make a mistake. And at that moment, I, I knew, to be honest with you, I'm like, man, this has been their guy from day one. And this was the reason they were, they were looking for to, to justify that. And I just continued to try to control what I could control, but they ultimately ended up rolling with him. And I, for a, a little time, I was bouncing around the league trying to get another opportunity. And I, I remember the, the weirdest part about it for me was going in and meeting with teams and having them thinking that I had character issues. I remember like three or four teams, they reach out to my agent and they're sitting down with me. I'm like, yo, this guy should have never beat you out. Like, what's going on? Like, and they're thinking it's an issue with me. And I, I'm not going to bad mouth the coach or anything. Like, man, that's out, that's out of my control. Like, guys are reaching out to me on the team. Like, man, you should have made the team. Like, man, that's out of my control. I can't control that. And But the thing that bothered me was teams asking if I had character issues, a guy that's been a team captain everywhere that I've been. And um, it, was, it was weird for me, but I knew that's the business sometimes. And... It's ultimately something that worked against me throughout the process. And teams will justify that. Once, once teams get a get a get something, a narrative they can push about you, a lot of people don't do the research that they that they need to do to see to ju- justify and see if it's true. And that was ultimately the situation I was put in. I had like three or four workouts. I'm going in, I'm calling my family. I'm like, yo, I'm signing with this team. There's no doubt in my mind. Then I sit back down and told him, like, yo, do you have care issues? So I don't know, like, if a message was spread about me or what, but, like, man, this is a guy that when you go back to the pre-draft process, um, going through all these scouts, like, man, every single person at Florida State University loves you, from the janitors, no matter who we talk to, they talk about how you're a guy of higher character. So just to hear that, People are questioning my character at this point. I was wondering if there was something that was put out about me from the last, uh, and it was out of my control, but it was, it was frustrating for me. I imagine that. So, so your football career, you had decided, you, you know, you realized, okay, the fullback position is something that's kind of going extinct and you decided, okay, when did you come to that point that, that you weren't going to pursue the football dream anymore? It was actually when I was going through the process with the AAF league that folded. Mm-hmm. So we're going over there. We would, I'm in Orlando with Coach Bird. And he was like, man, Freddie, man, you have a long career in the NFL. He's like, but we just don't use fullbacks. I'm like, man, this is crazy. Like, I'm getting tired of hearing this one. Right. And it's around the time when my daughter was getting ready to be born. And I found out I'm about to be a dad. So I was just talking with my agent. He was letting me know that I needed, I needed some film. So I was just telling him that I was going to ultimately try to make that tra- transition and see what was what was next for me, because I can c- continue to do this and continue to set myself back. But at this point, I have to put myself in provider mode and 
try to put some food on the table for my daughter that's coming into this world. So what were you majoring in at uh, Florida State? I came in as a business major, but I finished as a, with a degree in social science. And did you, did you, so did you plan on trying to use that or what, what, what did you decide as you, as you got into the, I guess, real world outside of football? Um, what was next? To be honest, it was a process for me. And uh, that was, that was the toughest point for me, just going through that phase of self-discovery and trying to figure out what I truly wanted out of life. Cause you go, you had something in college pursuing a degree, but Ultimately, in my mind, I'm thinking I'm going to have a 10-year 10, 10 career. So when it ends faster than I expected it to, it's like, okay, dang, I didn't, I didn't expect it like this. Like, people tell you these stories, but so many people, and I was one of these guys, like, man, that's not going to be me. I'm going to, have, I'm going to, get, a, I'm going to get some time in this league. I'm going to make a few Pro Bowls. So when that didn't happen, it was tough for me. And I know a lot of guys, they battle with the same thing, man, trying to – come to grips with that you just you just don't understand it and you never know if it can be you some guys draft day they, their dream came to an end and they didn't they didn't expect that and I was going through a phase where I was depressed battling suicidal thoughts and I didn't know what I wanted out of my life and it's crazy because I've always been a person that's optimistic in any situation but to have that snatched away from me especially when there are things outside of your control, it was, it was, it was definitely tough. A dream that I chased my whole entire life and had my whole identity wrapped up into that. So I just had to take some time back and self reflect and figure out who I truly was because I ultimately started going down a dark, a dark path and it almost cost me my freedom and almost cost me my life. And I had to sit back in the midst of that and find out who was Freddie Stevens. And <laughs> Sorry, you say it almost cost you your freedom. What what happened there? Yeah, so like just going back to my story, well, I've always grew up in an environment where we were we seen a lot of things early. My father, him being a drug trafficker, and that was what we saw growing up. So coming back after not making it in the ball, this is the environment that I have to go back to. And I I told myself for a while, like, man, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get wrapped up into this. And I just remember just training, 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 spending all my money on training. And I only had $650 left after everything came to an end and I decided to move on. And I was just frustrated, bitter, mad at the world. Like, man, I'm finna, I've been broke my whole entire life. My whole family's broke. I'm finna start making some money now. So I turned to the street life. And ultimately money started coming in fast. And it got to the point to where anything I wanted, I could have had it, but I still had that emptiness on the in, inside of me. And I remember one day, a guy, we had a transaction together and I didn't know him, but we had a mutual friend. So we sit down, do our deal, it's like $10,000. But he talks with me, he stops and it's risky in this business. He's uh -huh. like, yo man, I know you. And I'm like, yo, you don't know me, man. Like, get out of it. And he was like, nah, I know you, Freddie Stevens, and he played at Florida State NFL. Like, like, nah, man, nah, you don't know me. He was like, nah, what, what are you doing out here? And I'm like, yo, I just made $10,000 off of you. What are you talking about? He was like, nah, man, you can be doing way more with your life than this. Don't be out here risking your life every single day. Like, you, you, you're meant to do something great. And this is a guy I don't know at all. He's So, he, so he's paying you $10,000 drugs, and then he's like, Trying to save your life at the same time. Yeah, like, you, like, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be out here risking your life every day. You, you can do way more than this. And I'm like, yo, I just made $10,000 in under an hour off of you. And he's like, no, like, you, you. and he said, he's like, you have potential to do more than this. This is nothing. And that sat with me for a while. I'm, I remember going through the day, and I was like, man, it messed up my day. I didn't want to do nothing, man. Like, man, I ain't finna, no, don't nobody call my phone, man. That was the first time when I was in the streets that I felt like, yo, man, I, I'm a bum out here. Like, I got all the money, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a rich bum. And that's the first time I, I felt like that. Like, I'm like, Freddie, you wasting your life. And I knew everything that he was saying is true. Like, I didn't go to college. I didn't come overcome all these things just to go back and do something I could have done straight out of high school. Like, 
what was the point of going to college and getting all this education if you're going to come back and do this? So I ultimately had to sit, sit down and have a talk with myself and figure out what I was going to do. But the battle was, man, I'm bringing in all this money. Mm -hmm. So it was either going to happen by force or by choice. And at that point, I, was, I wasn't doing it by choice. So ultimately, it had to happen by force. And a situation um, came about that had me in a predicament where I was going to do a, a, a good amount of time. And I remember one of the guys in the investigation, one of the detectives, he, he came over to me. He's like, man, I watched you play coming out of high school. Like, you don't know me. And I remember telling him, it, it's crazy. I told him I don't like cops. I told him, I was like, man, I do not like cops. I saw, and my, my experience with police officers was started from my, my dad, not when he was in the streets, but when he changed his life around, because my father's a pastor. Now. And, and I remember them coming in one day when my sister, she called 911, like playing on the phone, my baby sister, by accident. She called 911 and they came in, asked us everything. We're, we're, stay, we're staying home alone. My parents had left us home alone. I think they were at a church revival or something. So it's me, I'm the oldest there at the time, watching my two little siblings. So they come in and they're trying to get information. And my little brother, he tells them who my, who my dad's name, that's who, whose house it is. So they go outside and I know they put his information into the system. And all of a sudden they come in and all hell broke loose. Like they were chill before, but then they knew who he was. And they were, they come, he comes home like, yo, you child abandonment. They call child services and everything. And I'm like 13 at this time. And like child, they call child services, like, yo, Child neglect, he, he's abandoned these children, left them home alone. And we had something on our back door because the back door was broken. And they just block it all just in case somebody broke in, they could hear it. But we knew how to get in and we knew how to get out of it. it like, yo, he has these kids blocked off. If anything ever happens, they can't get out. I'm like, man. So the lady comes in and she kind of saves my dad. But that, that bothered me because they the only reason they did that is because they looked up his record. So they were trying to get him on something petty because my father already had two strikes. Mm -hmm. And fast forward to the situation, I'm telling the detective, um, I don't, I don't have good experience with police officers. I don't like cops. I'm like, listen, man, I don't care about any of that. Because I'm gonna tell you how to get out of this situation because they have everything they need on you to make an arrest. Like, I'm not sure why they have it, like, but I'm gonna make sure that you're protected in this situation because I know what you're going through. You're mad at the world right now, but I'm not gonna allow you to throw your life away. And it was crazy. He was kind of giving me giving me tips through everything. After me telling him that I didn't like cops, he could have just like, all right, do this on your own. And it's crazy. A cop was the one that kind of helped me get my freedom. So so now, and now, how do you how did what's your purpose in life? What what did you see? So you went through that tough transition there. You you basically had a drug customer and a cop, two of the most unlikely people at that time, basically turn your life around. Tell us how you went from that point on and what you're doing with your life now. Okay, so I'm still going through the, the phase. I'm going through the investigation. I, I got guys reaching out to me. I had a guy that was living in my, in my neighborhood. He called me and he was like, man, they've been in your house for like four hours. So I'm realizing it's getting hot. And during this process, a mentor reaches out to me. He's like, man, I want you to come speak at this high school. We have an all-star game going on this weekend and we want you to come speak. I'm like, man, I don't, I've never spoken in front of a, a large crowd before. I, I can't do it. He's like, man, just come in and be you. I'm not worried about that. They, they need to hear your message. And I think he knew what I had my hands in. And I was, I was like, all right, I, I'll do it. I had so much respect for him. And I remember them paying me before the event. And the day of the event, I just like, man, I don't know. I've done all this practicing to, to put out a good message. And I get there and I'm driving to the event. I'm like, I'm gonna call them and tell them they can have their money back. I'm not doing it. I don't know, I just was nervous. But something just came over me and just, I just kept driving. I'm like, man, you can't continue to run. You gotta face this. And I remember getting in there. I know all these people have these crazy stories about how they found out something was at purpose because they went in the first time and they killed it. That wasn't my story. <laughs> I went in and I absolutely, it was terrible. It was trash. But the thing that was crazy is I was inexperienced and 
didn't have have a great performance, but everybody's coming up to me after saying how I made an impact on their lives. And I was confused, like, man, what's going on? Mentor comes back to me, he's like, man, that passion that you put in the, the football, you speak with that same passion. You speak with that same purpose. This is what you've been meant to do since you were younger. You just were running from it. And it's crazy because I remember in college, even in high school, my coaches, Jimbo was getting mad at me, like, man, you need to speak up. These When you talk, they shut up and they listen. And I've always had that ability to control the room. And I, I've known it, but I've just, sometimes when you take that step forward, you, you, it kind of scares you because now you got you to gotta consistently do this. Right. And that's that's kind of what scared me. But I was to a point in my life, like, man, I'm, I'm tired of sell, settling. I'm, I'm ready to do what I was brought here to do and I'm, I'm ready to make an impact. And part of it was me going through that process. I knew that I wanted to make a difference in the lives of people who may go through what I was going through during that journey. So that's ultimately what led me to speaking. And then I wrote the book. So, so now I'm doing a lot of different things in the community to get my, my story out there. But it's ultimately just trying to put the resources in place for individuals so that if you go on to be an athlete, whatever the case may be, doctor, whatever it is, that you're prepared for life after and you have a resource in me to tap into. You can watch my story. And guys that come from these underprivileged backgrounds, whatever it may be, going through a struggle in your life, you're not really sure about what to do next. I found my purpose in the darkest moment of my life. I don't know if I'm going to be cuffed up. Right. I find purpose. And that's ultimately how, how life works sometimes. If you continue to believe and push forward and control what you can control. And I, tr I, tr I truly believe that now I've got myself back to a place where my mind, I've done a lot of reading, I've done a, done a lot of studying and just sitting back and reflecting and meditating. And my mind's in a, in a place that it's never been in. So just using this wisdom to give back to anyone out there that's looking for a reason. I had someone, like, I believe it was like six months ago, reach out to me and they were suicidal. Didn't play sports or anything. I mean, I came across your story. I read it and it, it saved me from taking my life. Wow. And that was just, it was huge for me. I, I never told him that, but that, that, that feeling, you don't get that from scoring touchdowns. That's how I knew this was what I was supposed to be doing. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, and there's so much more in the book. So tell everybody again, um, the title of your book, where they can find it. Yeah, the title of the book is Trials of Triumph. And they can find it on Amazon. You got the ebook and, or the paperback if you want that. And of course, we do the, the personalized copies. I have our email on there if y'all if y'all want to reach out to me and feel free to follow me on my social media platforms at Struggle Made 105. If you want to reach out to me and get you a personalized book, feel free to. And the name Struggle Made 105, the, your clothing line, that Struggle Made 105, where'd you get that name from? Is that from the cheeseburger store? Yeah, from the cheeseburger. Wow, because a dollar and five cents. Yep. Yep, good deal, good deal. Well, Freddie, I really appreciate your time. It's a fantastic story. It's awesome to see that you were able to, to fight your way through what you said, like you said, one of the darkest times. Um, and now you're using it to, to better uh, young people and, and just people in your community. And I really appreciate your time, man. I appreciate you having me. Yes, sir. Keep up the good work. And um, I'll be talking to you. All right, thanks so much for Freddie Stevenson. Hope you guys enjoyed that. You know, I, I the thing I think I appreciate the most about his story is the fact that it's not really a storybook tale. Um, it's not a made-for-Hollywood story because if it was, then he would have made it to the NFL, he would have had a long career, would have been successful, his promise to his mom would have been fulfilled, he would have, you know, had all kinds of money to, you know, totally change her life, and it didn't. And Freddie had an opportunity. Uh, he had a choice to make. You know, do you go down the wrong path? Do you, uh, you know, stay on the straight and narrow? Do you try to find ways to, uh, you know, find your way in the world? And he started going down that wrong way. And it's just remarkable. The, the elements, the two people who were the key figures were the most unlikely of uh, heroes 
uh, in in this story. And you know, I I think that uh, it, it's great, and it also teaches us lessons um, as far as you know perseverance. And just because things don't work out the way you planned, doesn't mean that you give up. You keep on, you know, pressing on. You keep on. Um, you take self inventory. You you reassess and figure out uh, the best path for you. And that's definitely what Freddie has done and is is continuing to do. So much, um, you know, best wishes to him. Thank him for his time joining the Football Jones podcast. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. Thanks so much for joining me. Once again, you can read me at usatoday.com. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram um, at by Mike Jones. Uh, do me a favor, share this podcast with a friend or two, and I'll talk to you guys again next time.